subject. Why does the Bible place so much importance on baptism? The importance of baptism, respected friends, in the wisdom of Almighty God, begins with Noah and the flood. Early in the book of Genesis. But we find it is not referenced as baptism until we get to the New Testament. Where in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, we read, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. That was because of the iniquity of the world at that time. The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, in fact, for 120 years, while Noah built the ark, while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls or lives, were saved by water. They were saved by being put in an ark and engulfed in the waters of the flood. But then the Apostle Peter goes on and he says that this is the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. He says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection or empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ it has the idea of pro providing the path. The resurrection of Jesus Christ provided the path whereby the principle of baptism can enable us to be saved. And so when we have considered but two verses, ladies and gentlemen, we can see that there are, in fact, a number of reasons already that surround this principle of baptism. It involves being engulfed in water. It involves standing aside from the things of the world about us. It involves having a good conscience towards Almighty God. And we are told that it involves the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so already, respected friends, we have a number, number of principles that are set forward in the scriptures. Now, when we go back into Genesis and look at the Genesis account of the flood, and if we go back to Genesis chapter 6 and go to verses 12 and 13, we read there that God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. So there's a problem, isn't there? Almighty God has looked upon the people on the face of the earth at that time. And in fact, he found that it was only corrupt. That all of mankind had corrupted themselves in the eyes of Almighty God. He says all flesh had corrupted his way, the way of God, upon the earth. And so God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. Almighty God was prepared to totally destroy the earth that he had created. For the earth is filled with violence, somewhat like ours today, no doubt, through those people. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. But Noah, we find, found grace in the eyes of Almighty God. For if we go back to verse 8, we read precisely that. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because he had a conscience towards Almighty God. And this grace, this undeserved favour... Because no doubt Noah was like us and didn't do everything perfectly. So Almighty God was prepared to extend to him grace or undeserved favour. And this becomes a major defining point in the principles of baptism as we find them in Scripture. 
So how did Noah find grace? If we read from verse 17, Almighty God says, And behold, I even I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, Noah, will I establish my covenant. Now that's another very important principle when we come to consider baptism. A covenant is an agreement that we put our life on. We will not change it while we are alive. And that covenant was between Noah and Almighty God. And so that covenant also was binding upon Almighty God. And thou shalt come, Noah, into the ark, which you're going to prepare, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and every living thing of all flesh, Two of every sort thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, and they shall be male and female. And so Noah found grace with Almighty God through the terms of this covenant that he made, or Almighty God made with Noah. So now when we go back to 1 Peter chapter 3 in verses 20 and 21. We find that he says there that the saving of Noah in the ark of refuge which, he, which Noah built is likened to baptism. And so these principles that are coming out of Genesis chapter 6 and teaching us about what happened in the flood of Noah's time have reference to the baptism that we can be involved with. For he goes on and says, just as the water saved Noah and his family, because it lifted them above the destruction that swept away the ungodly world, so the waters of baptism can save us from the judgment that Christ will shortly bring upon the wickedness of our age. The Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 17, likens our day and age to the days of Noah. So we know that we live in very similar times to Noah that were swept aside by the flood. But Almighty God said to Noah that he would not destroy the earth again with a flood. And he has set before us the principles of baptism that we might escape from the iniquity of this world. And so let's summarise what we've learned already. Firstly, Noah's flood involved a covenant. Why was this? Because in the eyes of Almighty God, all flesh had corrupted God's way upon the earth. Almighty God said, I will destroy them with the earth. But by the long suffering of God, eight lives, Noah and his family, were saved by water. Because Almighty God said to Noah, with thee will I establish my covenant. You've got to go into the ark to be baptised typically in that ark with the waters engulfing that ark, no doubt, in the deluge that came upon the earth to keep them alive. And Peter says that is the like figure to baptism which now saves us. But it requires a good conscience towards Almighty God. And we can only have an evil conscience if we know nothing about Almighty God. And so that implies that we must have a knowledge and an understanding of the things of God. And in fact, it implies also that we must walk by faith. And that means that we do the actions which come out of our faith. And that this is empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so fundamentally we can see that man had corrupted the way of God upon the earth. And God determined to correct this. But Noah found grace through a covenant with God involving baptism that he might be saved and that is the pattern for our salvation. 
In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, we read that by faith Noah, and this is the Apostle Paul's summary of the faith of Noah. Remember I just said that everything here implies the need for knowledge and understanding of the way of Almighty God. We also need to understand the iniquity of the world about us by being able to recognise the righteous ways of God and the unrighteous ways of the world about us. And therefore, because Noah understood those things and because he understood the things of Almighty God, he had faith in what God said. He had faith in the principles God set before him and by that faith, he being warned of God of things not seen as yet, and we're being warned all the time, ladies and gentlemen, of similar things by the signs of the times around us if we read and understand this book so that we understand what is happening about us. We can see the iniquity of this world from those things. And so he was warned of God of things not seen as yet and he was moved with fear. Godly fear. He prepared the ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. He stood aside from the world, condemning it because of its iniquity and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah didn't have any more righteousness himself than we do. The only way we can obtain righteousness is that it is imputed to us, as the Apostle Paul says, by Almighty God through our faith, through the channel of our faith. Now, in a second situation in the Old Testament, Israel were baptised into Moses when they were delivered from Egyptian slavery. And so this is a second situation which is referred to in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10 that we read just a few moments ago that refers back to something that happened in the Old Testament. And this is what happened to Israel who had gone down into Egypt, sojourned there for 400 odd years and then under Moses came out of Egypt that they might become the kingdom of God in fact upon the earth, the nation of Israel. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you would turn there, please, the apostle says, Moreover, brethren, would not that you should be ignorant. Again, the need for knowledge and understanding to develop faith is being emphasised to us. How that all our fathers, the forebears of the people of Israel that Paul, that Paul was t speaking to at this time, they were all under the cloud, and clouds, of course, are made up of water vapour, aren't they? And all passed through the sea. They had a wall of water on both sides as they passed through the Red Sea and were all baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so again we have a principle being set before us that all of Israel were baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea as they passed through the Red Sea. Now again, this event is full of similar detail to the events of Noah's day. Because we find that Israel grew as a nation and became a, a, a nation within a nation but subject to bondage in Egypt. And typical of the bondage to sin and death that existed in Noah's day and similar to the bondage to sin and death, in fact, that we are under in our natural state. If we, go, if we come back to Exodus uh, chapter 1 and verse 7, we read, And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. So here you had Egypt with the nation of Israel growing in its midst and becoming a problem to them as they saw it. Now there arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. Now Joseph had been an Israelite who had been a very faithful one 
and had been of considerable benefit, in fact, to Egypt. But he was long gone, and so were the pharaohs that had seen the benefits of Joseph and the influence of the Israelites in their midst. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, which would have been a good idea. Make peace with them. Lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join, us, uh, join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them out of the land. And so we find in verse 11, they decided, let us set taskmasters over them, make them slaves, to afflict them with their burdens. And they built the, uh, for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they grew. They multiplied and grew. And the Egyptians were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigour. And so Egypt now, rather than dealing wisely with them, became the oppressing power to Israel. A pagan power that knew nothing and respected nothing of Almighty God, that were oppressing the people of Almighty God, as they should have been. In chapter 3 and verse 7, we read, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, as the Egyptian affliction became more and more, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. Sorry, and in chapter 13 and verse 3, Moses said unto the people, after they had passed through the Red Sea, this was, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now the reason we've considered those verses is so that we can understand that Israel were in bondage to Egypt. And the Apostle shows that this is equivalent to them being in bondage to sin because Egypt was a power that only knew sin. They did not know a way of righteousness. And, and Moses goes on and says, For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. So their salvation from that was because of the hand of Almighty God being good towards them. But this deliverance from Egypt, from the oppression of Egypt, was not that they might serve self. Israel were called upon to serve Almighty God. Back in chapter 3 and verse 12. And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of his Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. That was the Mount of Sinai. And so Israel would be delivered not to serve themselves, but to serve Almighty God. And if we go to Exodus chapter 14 and verse 5, we now read of the situation where Israel decided they were to flee from Egypt. And in verse 5 there, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled from Egypt and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this that we have let Israel go from serving us, from our bondage? And in verse 10, when Israel fled, the Egyptians marched after them. And in verses 13 and 14 we read, And Moses said, because see what happened, if you see in this picture here, it's actually the Suez Gulf. This is the northern side. That there are cliffs on the Egyptian side. And when Israel fled from Egypt, they came, across the, came to the edge of those cliffs, against the Red Sea, and they were trapped by the pursuing Egyptian forces. 
and they crossed over the Red Sea, somewhere near where that photograph was taken. And so Moses said to the people, because he was communing with Almighty God, he said, fear ye not. Understand that Almighty God is able to save. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen, ye shall see them again no more forever. For the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And in verse 19 of chapter 14, the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And in verse 21, And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And in verse 22, And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea, upon the dry ground, with a wall of water on both sides, and the cloud of water also over their top, and they were baptised unto Moses in the, under the cloud and in the sea. And in verse 23, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning when the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud and troubled the host of Egyptian and took off their chariot wheels and so forth and they perished in the Red Sea. Now, after this event, which was effectively the baptism of the nation into Moses at this time, a covenant was involved. And that covenant is mentioned for us a couple of pages over in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. In verse 4, Almighty God said through Moses, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagle wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, and this is the critical stuff, respected friends, now therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And the people answered and said together, All that the Lord has said, we will do. In verse 8. And Moses returned the words unto Almighty God. And so all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. We agree to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, standing aside from other nations upon the earth. Now, a Christadelphian expositor that does a particularly good job of understanding these things said this. He said, the Israelites... Being born into national existence under Moses as a ruler and a deliverer, he led them from the Red Sea to the foot of Mount Sinai to meet with God. On their arrival there, the Lord commanded Moses to say to them, the words we have just read, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant and keep my covenant. What did Almighty God make with Moses, with Noah? He made a covenant with Noah. And so here, with the Israel having been baptised into Moses, Almighty God makes a covenant with them. Then, he said, ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
And John Thomas goes on and says, this was an offer on the part of God to become their king, predicated upon what he had done for them if they closed in with the proposal. In other words, if they kept their end of the bargain, they would henceforth become the kingdom of God. And so Israel were saved by water, by a covenant, they were then made a holy nation. And in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7, we read these words, Almighty God said to the children of Israel through Moses again, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am holy. For I am the Lord your God. And so these become the terms of the covenant. Applied to Israel. But respected friends, the Apostle Peter also applies them to us. Because in 1st of Peter chapter 1 and verses 15 and 16, he said the words that are on the overheads there. But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all way of life, as manner of conversation really means. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And so we can see, respected friends, that the same principles in general are being worked out. Down the left there, we have the covenant with Noah. But look now at what the covenant with Israel is involving. Firstly, the children of Israel became a mightier nation than the Egyptians because Almighty God had blessed them. And so the Egyptians oppressed them. The Egyptians became the sin power that Israel had to overcome, had to step aside from. And so Israel fled. Egypt marched after them and were destroyed. Almighty God saying to them, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Salvation doesn't come from the nations around us. And even when they come in upon us with all their might, Almighty God can still save. And so Israel went into the midst of the sea. Now how could they do that, respected friends? Without knowledge, belief, understanding and faith. And no doubt there were those there that when Moses said, we're going to go through that sea on dry ground, they said, I believe that God can do it. And so he did. But imagine those that were a little doubting. What were they like when they got to the other side of the sea? They were no longer doubting. They now had belief in these things. They now had knowledge of these things. They now had faith in these things and they are the very principles that are always in the background of the principle of baptism. And so the Lord Almighty God overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and that becomes an important principle to us because the old things of our way of life, of our world that we leave behind have to be overthrown like the Egyptians in the sea like the world of Noah's day. And they were baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, fully submerged again in water, effectively. And they were told, obey my voice indeed. We cannot be baptised. And then turn our ways back to the ways of Almighty God, to turn our hand back from the plough. But we must keep that covenant and continue to walk by faith and do the things of Almighty God. Be ye holy, for I am holy, is the principle that Almighty God sets before us, that was upheld by Noah and his family, that were upheld by the people of Israel at that occasion, and that must be upheld by us also. And so like Noah, and like Moses, we are called upon to come out of the world about us, in which we live, into a covenant relationship with Almighty God. And we read of that in the second of Corinthians and chapter 6. Because the Apostle Paul says there in verse 14, Be ye not 
unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now that's the very principle that was set before Moses. It's the very principle that was set before Noah. And here now, it is set before all the believers. For he says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? You see, Israel was a land of spiritual darkness. How could Israel, sorry, Egypt was a land of spiritual darkness. How could Israel walk in the light of the things of Almighty God in their midst? They had to be separate from them, even if they had to live amongst them. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? They must stand aside. If there's an infidel there, you must stand aside from it. it doesn't, the scripture doesn't tell us that we must go around, like some people say, and kill the infidels. That judgment belongs to Almighty God and not to us. But we are to stand aside from that way of life and be an example to the world about us of the way of Almighty God. And so in verse 17 he says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean things, the pagan rituals and rites and everything of, of Egypt, or the corruption, the moral and, and violent corruption of the world of Noah's day, or of our day. And he said, I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters saith Almighty God. And so again, knowledge and faith is required to establish a moral stand in our life against sin in all its aspects. Now when we come to consider baptism itself, it's first actually mentioned in Scripture in the New Testament, not in the Old Testament. It's referred to Events are referred to in the Old Testament, as we have seen, that are referred to as being baptism. But in Matthew chapter 3, we read of the work of John the Baptist. And verse 5, and John went out, th uh, sorry, then went out to John, John the Baptist, to him, people out of Jerusalem and out of all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan and were baptised of John in Jordan confessing their sins. And in verse 11, John said, I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, is mightier than I, and so forth. And so what do we see here? The first thing we see is that John baptised in Jordan. Why did he do that? Again, because it needed water. It is not sufficient to sprinkle a bit of water around, but we must be submerged in the water, symbolic of death and resurrection, as we're going to see, God willing. And John said, I indeed baptise with water unto repentance. And so now we have another little principle, don't we? A principle that's in the background to everything we've already seen. Because Noah had to repent of his world. The children of Israel had to repent of the world of Egypt. And the principles we have already seen are showing us that we also must turn our back on the world and repent of the world about us and be baptised so what does repent mean? The Greek word that's translated repent in our King James Version is the Greek word metanoio. And it means to change one's mind. Heartily to amend with abhorrence of one's past sins. So again we have the principle of knowledge, understanding, Belief, 
And now repentance, because we're now starting to understand the requirements of Almighty God. We're learning what is right in the sight of Almighty God and what is wrong in the sight of Almighty God. And we are learning to stand aside, to turn our backs on, to turn about and go in a different direction to the things that belong to the world about us. And so it continues the theme of Noah standing aside from his world, of Israel standing aside from Egypt. And it anticipated the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ who overcame the world, who did no sin and is the example for us. And so we need a change of heart leading to a changed way of life. We indeed need to repent of the past ways of our natural life. And we need to be baptised. And so what does the word baptise mean? Again, it's the Greek word baptizo that is translated baptise in our version of the Bible. And it means to immerse, to submerge like a sunken vessel, the ship that sinks gets baptised. To cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash oneself, to bathe, to overwhelm. But the commentator here, Strong's, says it's not to be confused with bapto. Because bapto simply means to dip or to sprinkle. And Nikander, and I'm not sure who he was, but what he says is right. He says that in order to make a pickle, so we know what pickles are. You buy a jar of pickles in the supermarket and you take that out and you enjoy to eat it. Now, how do we make that? How do you make a pickle, he says. So in order to make a pickle, the vegetable, the vegetable should, fir the little cucumber should first be dipped into boiling water. So you dip it in boiling water. And that is bapto. Because it produces no permanent change. And then he says, it is baptised, the Greek word baptizo. In the vinegar solution. Now he says both verbs concern the immersing of the vegetable in a solution. But bapto is temporary. Goes in, gets wet, dries, the effect's gone. But the second, the act of baptising that pickle, changes permanently that pickle. And that's what baptism must be to us, respected friends. And it is the belief and the faith that turns our lives around that becomes the permanent dye in the water of baptism for us. Now Israel, as we have seen, had been nationally, nationally baptised into Moses and John had called them to the baptism of repentance. Now Christ commissioned the apostles to baptise individual believers of the gospel into his name. Because Christ increased and John decreased. And in Matthew 28 we read that he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And in Mark chapter 16 he said, He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. And we've seen those principles. We've brought them out. Now, I want you to consider this little chap. I know him very well, actually. But as a babe, he was christened into the Methodist church. I think they were short on members, actually. But he was dipped. He was baptised. He wasn't baptised. Why wasn't he baptised? Well, consider that photograph. Because that photograph contains all the evidence that I have that I was christened. That gown, probably crocheted by my grandmother. She did it often. And the shawl, I know she crocheted that. That's the only evidence I have. And I was told that that photograph was taken to commemorate my baptism at birth into the Methodist church. And yet all he knows now, in fact, 15 years later, 
I can testify that that little chap then did not really know if there was a God. He did not know who Jesus Christ was. He knew nothing of God's plan and purpose. And the Bible on the shelf in the lounge room was a book we were told, never touch it. I'd never opened it to that point. And yet he can testify, therefore, that this church rite was not baptism as we have had described to us in the Bible. And surely that in highlights to us the importance of baptism. So what about the baptism of the apostles? Well, firstly, it involved identification with the sacrifice and resurrection of Christ. And we're going to steam through these things. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 6, he said, Paul said, Know ye not that as many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Now we have entered, we, we are, now have this principle of the death and the resurrection of Christ coming into these things. The death being representative, in, in the case of Israel, of Egypt perishing in the Dead Sea, of the, the world of Noah's day perishing in the flood. So our old man, our old way of life needs to perish because we're baptised into the death of Christ. And so the old man is now dead, just as the world of Noah and Egypt. And therefore, the apostle goes on, we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. We've seen that principle, haven't we? That henceforth we should not serve sin. And so we must walk as new men in Christ. If he that is dead is freed from sin. If we be dead with Christ... We shall therefore also live with him. In verse 11, likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Leave Egypt behind. Leave the world of Noah behind. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto the principles of righteousness of Almighty God. And so baptism links us with the sacrificial death of Christ, which destroyed the body of sin, overcoming its sin power, creating a basis for forgiveness. The former way is like the world of Noah and Egypt. We are enslaved to sin. But the new way in Christ signifies our repentance to walk in the way of almighty God's righteousness in a new covenant involving, in fact, the covenants made with Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and David. And they are subjects which we consider from time to time in this place. In Galatians chapter 3, we read of this where Paul says, For we are all the children of God by faith in Christ. For as many as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. We become all one in Christ. And we become heirs according to the promise, the covenants of promise. And so again, we've got a summary, haven't we? John baptised in the River Jordan. They confessed their sins. It involved repentance. The apostles were told to teach all nations belief essential, baptising them. He that believeth is in and is baptised shall be saved. It is in the likeness of the death of Christ and it will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We, we go into the waters of baptism and leave behind that old man and rise up as new men to newness of life as Christ was raised up by the glory of the Father. And we're told, obey my voice indeed. Keep my covenant as Israel were told. Be ye holy, for I am holy, as Israel were told. 
We are to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, all one in Christ, heirs according to the promise. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul speaks of our former way of life. He says that before we are baptised, we are without Christ. We are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We are strangers from the covenants of promise. We have no hope. We are without God. We are in the world. But now, after our baptism into Christ, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the poured out blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need a change status before Almighty God. And baptism gives it to us. We are told, as uh, the Apostle Peter told the people on the day of Pentecost, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. What, why does the Bible place so much importance on baptism? Well, don't be caught unawares. The wisdom of Almighty God requires that we truly comprehend the importance of baptism and that we repent and be baptised for the forgiveness of our sins to enter into covenant relationship with Almighty God and his Son. Thank you.